so a bit a bit on my background i'm um fairly new now almost uh, must be uh, uh four months with the tcci um i've had a background in in systems um which means i've had a very uh, active role in implementing workplace health and safety systems in in, in lots of businesses um both in uh, new south wales and for the last 12 years or so here in, in Tasmania across the state. Um, I've come on board with the TCCI to um, in the southern end of the, the state to try and uh, assist with rolling the pro, you know, support um, from the TCCI to, to businesses. And it's not just our TCCI businesses either. We, Janelle and I, supply that service to uh, to any business that requires health and safety advice or support. Um, and we do that through uh, WorkSafe Tasmania. Um, so what I'd like to do is basically musculoskeletal um, is a uh, area, um, it's the most uh, common injury in the workplace and it's a very broad topic um, so to give some structure to the topic, I'm just basically going to follow the um, Safe Work Australia code of practice um, and we'll work through, um, and I've pulled out some key points um, on, the, on the code of practice, which give a very good and structured way of looking at musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and yeah, just pull out some key information and try and add value through through what my experiences, and I'll ask Janelle to jump in with her experiences that we've come across uh, in workplaces. And that's where I, if you've got a specific area in your your business to to send us a chat or even email Janelle or I, um, and I'll just run that by you now. That's safety at tcci.com.au. Um, and I'll give that again at the end of the presentation. But yeah, if you want to email us with any questions or further um, require some further information, yeah, please get in touch with us. Um, the first thing is a definition. What is a muscular skeletal disorder, um, which they abbreviate as MSD. Um, and these are uh, injuries. They're basically soft tissue injuries that um, occur strains, uh, muscles, uh, and then uh, discs, bad backs. Um, so mainly through strain and sprain, um, but they can be caused in a lot of um, ways in terms of uh, holding or pushing or pulling. So it comes under that manual handling, which is the topic that we associate MSD with. Interestingly, um, in the code of practice, they say that um, an injury caused by crushing or entrapment or cutting from a mechanical operation of plant is not included in MSD um, statistics. So we, we're very specifically looking at the soft tissues and the, um, the muscular um, issues related to the body. Um, we tend to get these in two ways. There's the, the gradual accumulation, the, the RSIs, the, the common one there where we're doing a, a job um, repetitive, repetitively. Um, and there may not be a lot of force involved in a repetitive job. It could be a very, um, a very light job like computer keyboards and, and we'd be all aware of um, the uh, good posture and, and what we need to do to try and manage uh, issues with, with our ergonomic posture to try and prevent injuries from um, using continuously or repetitively. Um, the other way, of course, is, is sudden force and damage caused by strenuous or, or heavy, heavy handling. Um, and they, they, they can be, um, they're usually lifting heavy weights or especially um, in the construction industry uh, using heavy, heavy equipment, manual tasks, shoveling, 
And these are often tasks, the interesting area of musculoskeletal is often these are tasks we can't avoid, um, which create difficulties for businesses um, and managing in the workplace because you can't, you know, the, our best way of, of controlling risks is to eliminate them. But awfully, often we just can't, we can't eliminate manual handling in the workplace because it's, um, it's, we need it to do the job and we just don't have other ways to do it. So I'll get further onto that in controls and, and some ideas for you on, on controlling it because we can't eradicate it from the uh, workplace. Um, So from the definition of a code of practice has a manual task requiring a person to lift, lower, push, pull, carry, move, um, hold, restrain a person or an animal or a thing. Um, and it can be repetitive, high sudden force, sustained awkward posture, exposure to vibration. And vibration's an interesting one. I don't think Australian legislation hasn't um, captured vibrations yet, but it is in the European um, safety laws. And now uh, machinery has to actually have a um, vibration measure. So just as we have decibels, it's, uh, they measure it in meters per second squared. So they'll have actually measures of acceleration that they must issue with um, small plants. So things like lawnmowers and um, uh, rattle guns, drills, all those sorts of vibratory equipment. Um, in, the, in the future, I think within the next five years, we'll see in Australian standards that it will have to print the um, vibration on, the, on its label. So be aware that that one is on the horizon. Um, I'll just, uh, if I can go into, I'll just digress from the, the code of practice for a minute um, and talk a little bit about statistics. Um, Safe Work Australia last year put out a um, research paper in um, collaboration with La Trobe University. And they looked at heavily into the statistics of musculoskeletal injuries. And one of the things, uh, they uh, were extracted from that report is that uh, a lot of injuries aren't truly reported for musculoskeletal. We tend not to report them in workers' compensation until they stop us working. So there's this hidden, even though they are the largest uh, by percentage, um, some is uh, just looking for the statistics here um, that you'll find of serious um, work injuries. So injuries where somebody has spent a week or more away from the workplace, um, musculoskeletal um, compromise 50% of all claims. So it's, it's by, the next nearest claim is at about 19% or in the, in the teens. So with, it's just way ahead of, any other claim, serious, this is serious claims too, because they don't capture the small claims. So in serious claims, it's 50% of roughly 100,000 claims across Australia. 50% of those are all musculoskeletal. Of course- I, Sorry, Rod, could I just sorry? add some other stats to that too, which I know we're looking at sort of workplace, but looking at it from a big holistic approach as well, um, you know, in 2014-15, it was, um, the data actually showed that 30% of Australians, like whether they're working or not, had some type of MSD condition. Um, yeah. You know, so it's big even outside of the workplace. Um, and 72% of those were people aged 75 to 84. Yeah, I think uh, that was another huge. thing that was picked up in, the, um, in their research paper that... Um, there's a much higher injury rate in older people. Our workforce is aging. And um, so it's, it's the problem will increase in the next few, few years. Um, 
And so therefore, it's very important to maintain our workforce that we uh, manage the issue. Um, sort of costs we're looking at uh, in 2012-2013 from a paper they used this year, cost Australia $24 billion in compensation claims. So um, you know, even if Tassie's one, one tenth of that, you know, you're talking probably... You know, it's, it's millions of dollars, we, in, in that's in the claims. They're, they also point out that there are more, the individual actually has a higher cost than what the workers' compensation claims are. So it's, it's just a huge area of uh, problem area for safety and our, and our health in the workplace. Which it, it we, sometimes we, leads into other issues too, like they were saying that um, a lot of times, you know, someone that is that has got an MSD condition, they will pick up another type of um, health condition, whether it be a mental health condition that follows on because it's it's so long, um, you know, yeah. to heal sometimes. You know, a lot of people think, and I find this in workshops, and you probably do as well, Rob, that, you know, people say, oh, but workers' comp will cover that. Um, yeah. You know, but workers' comp won't get you to play football on the weekend or play cricket or motorbike riding or or whatever you want to do and those people that find that they're laid up on the couch for six seven ten weeks um it then affects their mental health as well you know so then you've got another condition that's adding to it you know it's not just the it's obvious the, the psycho psycho psychological i think they yes. call it psychosocial, psychosocial. <laughs> yep. Yep. um yeah it's this compounding and i think there's a they're starting to look at and in the paper they refer to the psycho psycho psychological um socio psychological if i'll get it right in a minute um that these are compounding factors and i, I think and it brings up to Janelle that the people carry injury. So you can carry injury from home to the workplace. And this is another area of the paper point. So people are carrying injuries into the workplace because they need to work or they want to work and they don't want to let their teammates down. So this complicates, of course, the um, workers' compensation side of events. So I don't want to go there today, but it just opens a whole another can of worms and very and difficulties in managing that. I worked as a workers' compensation um, role in a in a corporate and a national corporation in Australia, and um, dealt with a few cases in that workers' compensation area. So, you know, if people are concerned about that. Please, yeah, contact us, and we'll support you work through those issues because. Um, you get more productivity if people are not, if you can manage those issues and we know prevention is better than cure. So if we can look at where those issues are coming from, um, which I think I've got in, my, in the section on um, controlling risks um, further on in the, the presentation. So if we're looking at our, um, these injuries and these statistics, the process and the um, code of practice goes through the process um, and the codes of practice follow pretty, uh, the, the standard process of um, who is responsible and, and goes through it. But if I cut to the, I, you know, going to using the um, systematic approach of assessing risks in your work, workplace and that's, um, pointed out that it's such a complex problem and it comes we've got so many different um, avenues for these musculoskeletals and contributing factors that it's important to systematically approach your um, controls for uh, so that you're when you look at each issue you're considering the multiple of factors that are contributing to the musculoskeletal injury so with um, in identifying, we can look at where these risks are coming from. Um, typically, we look in our, within our businesses, um, so we can do the walk arounds, the audits. We can ask people. We can look at our statistics. But often in smaller businesses, it's it's hard to collect statistics from your business because you just don't have a big enough um, 
pool of statistics. You haven't got enough injuries to actually, you might have one eye injury this week and then you have two strains next week. So it's very hard to focus on what, so this is where we need to look at some industry trends um, and see our areas. And as soon as we start to look into industry trends, if we're in the um, personal care business, you know, and we, or in the care um, disability services, we're, we're lifting people. So, you know, there that's the, the high areas we need to control and come up with procedures to manage our risk there. Um, just what, going in. Sorry, one thing I have noticed with that, Rob, too, like those those industries and those areas of concern, it nearly becomes a, it's the norm. You know, yeah. this is how we, this is how it is around here as well. Um, you know, and I actually know attendants from the hospital, which were orderlies, as they used to be called. Um, <laughs> it's nearly become, I won't say the norm, but it's nearly accepted if somebody goes home with a type of, yeah. you know, musculoskeletal injury. I've, I've worked hard today, so, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. sore because of it, and that's good. But yeah, yeah. You know, and especially too, like, um, you know, with certain codes at hospitals like the code blacks you know you've got someone that's threatening so you know we're taking someone down or something like that you know you're, you're doing a dance with someone that you actually don't know which way they're going to jig or dag sort of thing you know and it's normally it's sort of become the this is what we do so this yeah. is okay you know okay. and I suppose looking at transport you know it's been the norm for years and years that people just jump off a truck or you know jump off a tray or jump off the step that yep. this is how we do things um we you know and i think about, sometimes yeah. too when we when we look at those risks in our workplace we become a bit complacent so we need to step back and go well okay we do do this but is it okay to do this yeah and i, I think as you're saying i would you know promote our service janelle because we're happy to you know come in with fresh eyes and, and looking businesses at at your processes having you know, seen experienced and seen what goes on in other businesses and it's not that we're doing the wrong thing it's just we don't know we do until things go wrong so um just be aware and I, yeah going back to the transport industry is classic when yeah, from your experience and mine we talked the other day about how you a truck driver will drive for two hours so you're just sitting in one posture and then you jump out of your truck and you jump onto the tray and throw your straps off and you, you so you go from sedentary motion to this sudden um, moving about so it's just becoming aware that this is where the danger point is and educating people that be aware that that's when you're going to strain something when you jump out and and going through and educating our workers on where those risky points are and like kathleen's just said in the chat there too rob like uh she's in civil, civil construction um, yeah. So it's a bit the norm that, you know, you will tire out and your body will wear out. Um, you know, and like Kathleen said, maybe it's time to change the conversation around that, that, you know, just because you're doing that job all the time doesn't mean that your body has to, to wear out. Um, you know, a lot of times we blame it on age or, you know, other things, but we're probably contributing to it as well or, or not holding yeah, back just... on, on some instances as well. Yeah, we want we want our our labourers, which are the high risk in this area, then we want them to have a future in our business because they carry knowledge. So we don't want to lose them through injury and um, have someone else that we've got to train up. So it's it's changing that expectation. And I, I must say, I'm of that school. I've got a few years behind me now of of where that was the accepted practice. And it's uh, no, I've done it for 20 years. I've always done it this way, and it's not the way we want to do it anymore so they're the ones we have to get the old stubborn blokes <laughs> we've got to find we've got to get new cultural change into them um, but i don't so think we... it's even the blokes like when you look at aged care facilities um oh, you know the the women yeah. are the same you know it's we've done it like this for a long time and even things like the tea trolleys um you know that's I've, I've found that they're stacking the tea trolleys that high that they can't see where they're going, so they're automatically leaning to the side, which is, you know, they're no longer walking how they should do, you know, yeah. and you, you don't look at it as a big issue, but you do that every day for 10 years and walk sort of like a half shut pocket knife, um, you know, at some point it's going to do it, you know, and it's, and the the worrying thing about that is too, that when we've got these people that are, 
the people we look up to, the people that have actually been doing that job for a long time, sadly, they're automatically training the next people next that are coming generation. through, the next generation, to do yep. the same thing. You know, this is how we do it here. This is always how we've done it. You know, nobody's great, ever point, stacked yeah. the trolley too high. Maybe we need more trolleys that the top shelf is a lot lower. So we can't stack high. But until people are recognising that it's becoming an issue, nothing changes. Changes, yeah. 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 Um... So I think we've, we've covered, um, well, covered on a, a few of the causes, where they come from. And I guess the, the, the next, well, not the next section, but the section after that, um, actually points out section 3.3 I'm going to go to is um, assessing the risks and the, looking at the risk factors. So, and there the, it's, it's, very well laid out in the, the code of practice. It, it breaks it down and actually has diagrammatic um, diagrams, diagrammatic representations, but no, they're diagrams showing these sorts of movements. So we know it's repetitive movement and it's sustained awkward postures. But what, what we can look at um, is bending the back forwards sideways. This is in the code of practice, more than 20 degrees. So it's got 20 degrees for bending forwards sideways, um, bending the head backwards more than five degrees. And of course, it's easy to say five degrees. So what we need to do is, is get this detail from the code of practice, and we'll put a link up afterwards um, to the code of practice. You can get these specific details from the code of practice, but then you, you need to go and, and have someone and, and measure so that you get a, a feel, so that you don't have to measure every one that you look at but you get an idea of where 20 degrees is. You know, what do you reckon? Is that 20 degrees, Janelle? Or is... Sorry, I wasn't listening then because I was no, that's all right. to a chat. Okay. No, that's all right. <laughs> so, yeah, we, there are some very good. So we're looking at bending head forwards 20 degrees, uh, head backwards more than five, twisting more than 20 degrees, um, working above shoulder height. That's an old one I'm quite well aware of. Um, reaching more than 30 centimetres. So in the old terms, a foot. But that's, as soon as we have to reach, um, and it's the old lever, that's the old, using the old lever principle where the, um, the, the further you reach, the more strain it's putting on you because it's further away. And if you hold something, it's a very easy task. I use this in a manual handling training. You can hold something very light close to you and you move it out. 12 inches or a foot or 30 centimetres and try holding it there for a minute and your arms full, your arms are heavy, let alone anything else in them. Um, it goes on though, sorry, I do digress. Reaching behind well, the body. While you're, the, while you're digressing there, can I add a, an example of that? Yeah, this is what we want. Yep. Do you, mind, do you mind if I throw one in here? Mm. Um, in my mining days, in my um, drilling exploration days, we had core trays. And I was probably close to a metre long, had solid core, obviously, that was drilling out of the ground, etc., etc. Probably a foot and a half wide, uh, like I said, from about probably a metre long. And the guys would normally hold them. So the long way was this way. Um, the way that this actual drill rig was set up one day and the platform and the drill head and everything, the guys started carrying them long ways out like this. And we actually had a guy that actually hurt his back. Um, and he couldn't understand. He said, but I've carried these, these core trays, you know, for 30, 40 yes. years. Um, yeah. You know, why today? Well, that's because, you know, your arms are extended. The weight's now out further. So it's changed the weight. Um, yeah. You know, it's like a ball bearing sitting on a, a bit of cat gut or something. That ball bearing hasn't got the force behind it until you start pulling it back um, to let it go, you know. So the things change depending on the, the situation and the circumstances that they used in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and then, so that's the sort of weight stretching uh, type issues. The other ones that are just mentioned in there, which I haven't, you know, this was new to me, but is working with fingers close together or wide apart. So, again, it's looking at that because your fingers, there are a lot of muscles around your, your hand. And I do remember a carpal tunnel injury I dealt with, which was, very complex because the muscles around ankles and wrists are very complex. 
So again, there we're looking at what are the fingers doing in a particular task? Or in, and so when we do our analysis of um, manual handling, we can get down to that level. There's actually a pictorial of a body in the, the code of practice that actually, so that when we're looking at a task, even though we may be carrying that big core drill way out in front of us, what are our fingers? How are we holding? So we can look at those specific issues if we're doing a specific musculoskeletal risk assessment. Usually, unfortunately, we're probably just looking for risks in our business, let alone specific ones like that. But this is where the code of practice is very good if we do have manual, if we want to go right down to that track, it actually shows us how to do it in the standard practice. Code of practice, sorry, not the standard. Um, and the other one is, yeah, our position, squatting, knurling, crawling, lying. And, and you know, often we have to, you know, we look at lineys or um, construction industry. Okay, I've worked in construction, putting pipelines in the ground and the fellows, you know, to, to reach a connection or a valve, we lie on the ground and put our hand down a hole, you know, because that's, we just want to turn a tap on or off. And we don't think about what we're doing, but there's, if we have to do that continuously, then we're, we're increasing that risk and we've got to look at different ways of doing it. Um, so I think we've covered most of the, that was, um, the risk factors. So they're covered off in the code of practice again. Um, they do cover also other things cover are our work area and design, but often I find in construction and industry truck drivers, you never know, you, you don't have control over where you're going. So you can't actually design. So manufacturing, we should be building those factors in um, and asking suppliers of plant and equipment those issues, which brings an important fact. When you buy a piece of plant, you should be supplied with a risk assessment at the time of what the risks are on that plant. Um, I think you have to remember with that too, if you are, um, you know, looking at designing certain things for certain workplaces, you know, I'm not very tall, um, you know, so if you're, you're planning, you know, platforms or railing or workbenches or something for somebody that's six foot two, obviously what they're going to require is something different than someone that's five foot and a half. Um, you know, so we need to consider that. And I think sometimes too, we just think, right, we'll build this. You know, it's like a kitchen sink. You know, we all have the same high kitchen sinks. Sink. <laughs> but to some people, like washing up becomes a real effort because yeah. they've got to bend over and Philip's nodding. So he's, he's either really tall or really short. Um, <laughs> but, you know, even that type of thing, we just assume that one size fits all. Um, right. You know, we get yeah. into a car and we adjust the seat, but we don't seem to do that at our work stations and at our workplaces. To, yeah, as employers, we need to ask those questions. So when we buy new cars or new trucks or we're buying equipment, we need to ask the supplier and they have the responsibility to consider that. If we point it out to them that that's going to be a, an issue, then they've got, a, they've got a role under the Health and Safety Act to supply fit for purpose equipment. So often we just accept because that's the industry standard, but it doesn't mean it has to be and we don't question enough. And be careful uh, modifying if it's actually an engineered type you know, if you've purchased some plant That's equipment, right. yeah. um, you know, are you modifying and then actually changing? Um, you know, sometimes we we intend to improve something, but we've actually made it worse. worse. Um, and again, yeah. I know with drill rigs, the cage areas were too tall, too tall for some of our guys to reach over and, and put it, other rods on. So we had to get the manufacturers okay to actually do modifications to make it so it was more user-friendly for our staff. Yeah. And I think the final point just in, in assessing risk is, is the environment, especially if we're working outdoors. I know that was an issue where I, in my previous um, companies, is you know, in wintertime, we, we're doing muscium, we can be doing it early in the morning. So this is, you know, the, the air temperature or the conditions we're working in. Um, it's cold, our muscles are tense and we're not warmed up. So it exacerbates um, the injury. So it is important to look at our, our work environment. Um, so 
I think we've pretty much covered where the risks are and, and what they are. Um, well, how the contributing factors of risks. The next, I guess, is the key is section four in the code of practice is controlling the risk. This is what everyone wants the, the silver spoon, I suppose, here, <laughs> the one answer for all, which would be, um, but there is no one answer at all. We just have to be, um, we've, I think we really have to be creative and, and dynamic in this space um, and just learn if we can help each other solve those issues. Um, I talked before early on in the, in the introduction, in, in reality, hazards interact and arise from, from various um, inputs and, and dynamics, whether they're you know, outside, you know, pre-existing injuries, um, the way we're feeling. So there are all these contributing factors. Um, and, and that's what I said, I'm repeating myself, but yeah, systematic approach. So we go through our identify, um, assess the risk, put controls in place, and then we check our controls. So um, one of the points in the, the research paper, um, there are some issues with the hierarchy of controls in addressing um, manual handling issues, because um, as I said before, many of the physical tar we can't eliminate, we have to do, if we've got to dig a hole with a shovel, there's no, there's, you can't use a digger. You can't because we might be digging near power lines. So we need to, we need the finer digging skills. So we have to use a shovel. So in many of these tasks we have to, so we can't eliminate it. Um, so we should be again, so instead of, uh, it's not instead, but we should be looking to optimize um, the way we do the task um, rather than elimination. So we're immediately down the list of, of the hierarchy of controls. Um, Sometimes too, what we can do though as well as, um, and I know Rob and I had a meeting this morning about different things. I was talking about policies and procedures and safe work procedures and SOPs and SWPs, etc. You know, and sometimes we can have them written in our workplace, but are people actually following them like we want them to follow them? You know, so sometimes it's a matter of, you know, watching how someone does the task. So the SWP might be written up, right? So if we go back and we have a look at an injury and then we think, well, how on earth did that happen? Like, this is our SOPS, this is our safe work procedure. You know, it can't happen because this is how we're saying we want it to be carried out. But are our workers actually carrying it out per that procedure? Um, mm. Have they interpreted that procedure the same way as it's actually been documented? Is that, then I see this a lot, is the procedure that complicated um, that people actually look at it and go, I actually don't really understand what half of that says, so I'll just watch the other guys do it. The ones who have been doing it wrong for five years, I'll watch them. That's how I'll learn how to do it. You know, so as a workplace and as supervisors and managers and you know, whether we're in a WHS role or a coach, culture role or a HR role, you know, it's about being on that, that work floor, you know, and watching people how they're doing these tasks. You know, we can't assume that people are doing it the way we want them to do it. You know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need safe policies and procedures because everybody just do it right. Um, you know, so we have to make sure that, okay, if we've got these policies and procedures in place, are people actually working by them? You know, yeah. because it's pointless going back and looking at, you know, the plant and equipment. You know, is there something wrong there? Or, you know, we've got these procedures in place, but it must be plant and equipment or it must be, you know, whatever reason. It can be something very simple as, you know, not getting out of a truck ride. You know, we've probably got a truck driver that knows they should have three points of contact and know okay. they should come out backwards. But, you know, you could have the young guy that goes, well, this is just slow. Um, I can jump out you know, front all the time, or you've got the older guy that's done it the same way for it, you know, so we've got to make sure that we've got to watch how our workers do it. You know, we can't just assume that because we've got those policies and procedures in place that people are doing it as we want them to. And I think, you know, as in my experience with health and safety too, is we, we can over document, we can be in a safety role and we, in administration, we, we over document. So as you say, getting out of trucks is a, is a great example where, we can write a procedure for getting out of a truck, but do we really, do we need to go that, and is a truck driver really going to read the procedure and interpret it and read every step? So 
we don't actually, we want a procedure, but usually the sticker on the side of most trucks now, they have a sticker that says three points of contact. And in our induction, it's just a matter of pointing that out to people and then reinforcing that behaviour. Yeah. Um, so we and don't have to... watching that that's actually happening. Yeah, so it becomes, this is how you get out of it, but we don't need to document it and write it down in detail. We just need to make sure that we, people know what they've got to do. There's a simple... Yeah, diagrams are great because it's a picture. Do not, do not jump out of the truck. Do not jump off the trailer. That's right. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, whether they get out, you know, if they can have three points of contact and do it forwards, well, good luck to them. But <laughs> I think most of us realise if you turn around and go down back. So it's a great example of where we can overcomplicate um, health and safety, and we need to keep it simple and 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 direct it towards who it's aimed at. And then, yeah, as you say, we need to look at, um, make sure, so we need the auditing, which of course will be the step after controlling, is to then go and check that we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and review it. You know, if it's not working, if you've got 80% of your workforce that's doing it the wrong way, is the procedure written correctly? Correctly. You know, and so it's going back in and looking at it, you know, if we review things and, and anybody that's heard me in any workshops heard me talk about the cane toad scenario, you know, sometimes we can introduce something because we're going to think it's going to make things better, better and we've actually made things worse, you know, so don't forget to review, don't forget to go back and go, well, okay, we thought this was a good idea, but in actual fact, it's either created another issue or we've created a bigger issue than what we first thought. So, um, you know, a lot of people will write a procedure and that's the procedure then for 10 years. Um, and I've, you know, my experience, I've worked a lot with safe work method statements and I've always said, if you're not doing it on the job to the to the workers, I've always said, put a line through. If you don't do it, put a line You're only yeah. shooting yourself on it. You know, yeah. We probably put it in there because we need to protect ourselves from an administrative point of view. Yeah. But I said, if you're not doing it, then put a line through it. There's a reason why you're not doing it. And I would even go as far as saying that, Rob, like, you know, if you're putting a line through it, why are you putting a line through it? Exactly. Is it so. just because people won't do it because it's too hard or does it actually create a bigger issue or is there no reason for it to be there? Or over the years, we've got mechanical um, things that have changed how we do the processes so it's no longer required, but make sure that if you, you do change that process you know, why have you changed that process? So you do another bit of a risk assessment on that. Well, that's that's your review. So then you mm -hmm. find that you, your workers are telling you this isn't working and you, you can you can then change your procedure. In, it opens the, um, say, consultative process. Consultation is key in health and safety. And if they're putting lines through the thing, it, it opens the discussion, you know, and you don't blame them. You, you say, why are you doing it? I'm, you know, you can get their encouragement. Um, so yeah, controlling risk. I think we covered everything in controlling risk. Um, so we can look at purchasing equipment. Uh, we talked briefly about that previously. We make look at the heights and identify what the hazards are before we introduce um, new equipment into the workplace. Um, the other one is also try and identify how what when we introduce new equipment what hazards does that then introduce you know it'll take up space so then are we walking in a different way a hard one to explain but often we buy equipment to solve one problem and you alluded to this too Janelle that actually then creates five others so it's just being aware I think of that one um, when we're looking at jobs we need to consider work height position and space they all seem obvious, but sometimes we're limited. And again, I know in the um, in the care sector, you know, we when we're helping someone, you know, we, we're going to someone's home and we, we're assisting them in in toilets that are confined. You know, it's a restricted space, working space, and so you can't you can't go and change people's houses. So you've just got to address the problem and understand what the issues are and whether you need one or two people or you know, talk to the client on how you're going to handle this situation. Um, Are we going to wrestle with the rock wheeler before we get in the door? In the door. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Um, then, so there's the design layout. There's the actual 
handling of the item. So we consider the size and weight what tools and equipment and mechanical aids we can do. So your example of the core samples is a great one there, Janelle, you know, how we the core sample, can we change the size of the core sample? Um, can we break the load down? What then, we yeah. actually did there was um, change the setup of the drill pad. So where, yeah. you know, the, the head of the drill come down um, to the caged area, we actually expanded that. So just the whole drill pad probably wasn't set up to start with properly. So it wasn't, you know, we didn't really have to change the core trays because that had been worked for so long. It was the fact that he carried it a different way. So it was, we then stood back and looked at it and thought that's the way that the particular mine site had set up that drill pad um, because it was steep on one side. So they'd go a different side than what they normally would. So they'd go down two steps with all the core, you know, so it was a matter of then of, okay, we need to actually look at the, the site itself and change that a little bit so they could go back to carrying the call trays how they've always carried them. Um, and I think that particular guy, like he was as stunned as anybody. You know, I've always carried these. Why today have I hurt myself? Yeah, but you haven't carried them like that. Um, you know, a lot of people just assume it's still the same weight, um, but we've now got our arms extended. So like you said earlier, Rob, like it changes, you know, which muscles we're using and which bones we're using, which ligaments we're using and, um, you know, he was used to probably being broad in the shoulders, carrying like this. All of a sudden, he's narrowed up to get through um, and using different muscles to do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the controls. Um, the other area of control is, is our environment. Um, so I talked earlier about, you know, if we've got to work outside, how do we... Can we, you know, supply thermal, you know, thermal underwear so that our bodies stay warm and we're not getting hot, cold, hot, cold? Um, can we control the environment? Floors and surface, surfaces. Um, I know in a welding workshop that I worked in, you know, massive problem in winter time. You know, open warehouses and it, it dealing with steel. You know, in north of Tassie, you know, it's only a few degrees in winter time. It's um, and you're lifting lumps of steel. It's, it's not an easy one to solve, but um, again, it's the nature of the business industry and we just need to educate our workers and um, be creative in the way we solve these. I don't have the We've answer. We've seen over the last few years, a lot of people putting the rubber matting down. Yeah. You know, so we're not standing on the cold, wet concrete. Concrete. Um, you know, wet and, and I mean, even we talk about standing, you know, we look at our stand up, sit down desks and, and stuff like that. Like we've learned probably over the years that there's little things we can do that will actually improve it. There are, yeah. Um, and I've probably noticed, sorry, Rob. You're right, no. That, you know what I'm like. <laughs> I've even noticed it, like when we're talking about our environment, I've noticed it since COVID with me delivering so much training via Zoom. Um, by the time I finish a two or four hour training session, sitting in the one spot on Zoom, because I have a tendency when I deliver face-to-face, -face, I walk, um, I roam around, you know, and I'll sit for part of it and then I'll stand for part of it and, you know, I'll go around and see what everybody else is doing. But I find, like, after a few hours sitting in this spot, my shoulders are just burning, um, you know, and that situation's been brought on because of COVID, you know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we think that, oh, you know, Janelle doesn't have to travel in the car anymore, so she's reduced the risk down but I actually feel my back and my shoulders differently after delivering training that I never did before, it just from the environment in, situation. Comes in different ways, yeah. Um, the, the, other, the other tool that I've used, learned to use a lot in um, manual handling is our job and task rotation. Um, this is a, a really clever one um, because we don't have to change anything we, we actually do, so the, the hazard's still there. But instead of doing a task repetitively all day, we can rotate those tasks so that we, we're just exercising different muscles. Um, and and that it's, it's a huge way we can reduce that. It's a big, big changer in reducing risk. And also posture. So if we've got to hold something for a long period of time, it doesn't have to be a long period of time. We've just got to hold something and it's starting to get heavy. Just by changing our posture and doing it in different positions just reduces the strain on our body 
and it's a very simple tool in, in reducing that, that risk of an injury. Um, the other point the card of practice goes into is team handling. So um, your team lifts and, and utilising other people um, in, in that handling. And I think there's, that leads into the other one, I suppose, training. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, scope for training in the, the manual handling area, both for, for lifting, doing stretching exercises. Um, the, the key business in, in Tasmania I know of is um, United Petroleum and they, they do all their, their drives do warm up uh, exercises before they start their day. And it took a massive cultural change, but um, identified as a high risk uh, area in their business. And, and luckily they they have a very good manager who, who adopted it and he led by example and, and joined them for their exercises. Uh, often those sorts of changes uh, are hard to implement because we, as we said before, we're old school. Uh, we look silly doing our yoga before we do manual, heavy manual work, but it's, it's, if we want to have a healthy body later on, then they're the things we have to start introducing and accepting into the workplace. Um, so that covers off controlling the risks and the, the only other uh, the section after that will be is to review the controls once you've implemented the measures. So I, I pretty much come back to, again, using the systematic health and safety method of um, that's your, your register. So I, I, unless you're a large business, you'd have your manual handling risks just in your risk register. And that should be something that you review um, on, a, on a regular annual or even biannual basis. Just go through and check a few of them to make sure that everything's staying up to date in your system. Um, and the last section is on the role of manufacturers, but I haven't had a lot to do with manufacturers and manual handling. So yeah, it's a design area. And I think we covered that before where it's to question your suppliers because they have a, a, um, they have a responsibility under the health and safety laws. So I was going, the next topic I had was to talk about experiences, but I think we've pretty much covered that as we've gone through it. Um, we covered off all those questions there, Janelle. Yeah, and I think too, like, um, you know, for anybody that's attending the session today too, like if they'd like us to come in and walk around with them, because sometimes it's just a fresh set of eyes. Um, it's a free service. Um, we try to cover the state. So Rob and I sort of meet in the middle every so often. But, um, you know, sometimes it is just a fresh set of eyes, you know, how that person's sitting in that bit of equipment. I mean, we look at excavators or cranes and things like that years and years ago the, the seat was just in the one fixed position you know and over the years we've actually learned that they can do a full 360 and to change how we do things so sometimes it's just that fresh set of eyes that can come in and sort of go you know that person that's got a stretch and and funnily enough you know even in an office situation um and i can sort of see some of kathleen's stuff in the background so i checked there on the shelf before i actually was going to say it but there's so many workplaces that you go to that they have all their reams of paper on the top shelf, um, yeah. you know, a big bookcase because we're not using it all the time. We'll just get it down. Well, you've probably found the heaviest thing in an office to put at the highest point and then someone will go and stand on a chair with wheels. Um, now Kathleen's looking to see what she's actually got on the shelf. <laughs> but I see it all the time, you know, so we don't actually probably think that stuff and that that is really basic stuff. Like I don't know what, a ream of, or a box of ream of paper would actually weigh, um, no idea, but it's probably the heaviest item that we have in an office, you know, and people think that our office situations, um, I see Kathleen said, Kathleen said, I'm 180 centimetres, she can reach the top shelf, yes, but can you reach it with the weight that's on the top shelf, um, you know, so sometimes it's simple things like that, you know, we've, we just automatically put things that we're not going to use all the time on a top shelf, and that might be the heaviest thing that we've got. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as that, you know, or where we're putting the ladders or something, you know, we've got ladders to reach those high things in the workplace, but we've put the ladder way over the back of the storeroom that we're actually trying to reach over. So then you're lifting it up a lot higher than what you need to, um, to get it out. So it's all those little things too, that sometimes we forget, like we've got that stuff in place, 
but we're not using it as we probably should. Um, you know, and again, it's just because we go to work, we do our job, we do our task. You know, we look at the big risks in our workplace. And if you say to somebody, you know, what's your workplace biggest risk? Um, you know, if they're an electrician, they're probably going to say electrical shock or, or something like that. And then when you actually ask a person in a particular role, what's your particular high biggest risk, you know, and they're working in reception, they've really got to stop and think what theirs would be. And it might be that they're sitting at reception all the time. It might be that, you know, they're a point of call to be abused when someone comes through the doors. Um, you know, so we've got to remember that we've got to look at what everybody's dealing with, not just the big risks as a whole or the obvious ones, because sometimes it's the small ones that go under the radar and they're the ones that fester. And all of a sudden we've got, you know, 20 small injury claims. We haven't got big ones, but we've got 20 small injury claims, which are much the same. So you have to look at it and go, well, why are we getting all these small ones? And it could be probably a really simple fix. You know, so sometimes it is just a matter of, starting at your front door of your workplace, um, stepping back and actually watching how people do their jobs, um, you know, and just walking through and having that look through. And I mean, I know we do it at our workplace. You know, you just do the same thing day in, day out. Um, you know, you get into the car the same way. If someone pulled you up and said, do you realise how you got in that car today? And you'd be like, well, how did I get in there? You know, and you might have twisted or distorted to get in because we just are used to doing things the same way. But what I was sort of getting at with that, and I digress all the time, um, is that, you know, if, if you guys would like Rob or I to come to your workplace and help you with that stuff, you know, we're more than happy to do that. So, again, just shoot us that that email as well. And no task is too hard for us, Janelle. We, it's the curly ones. We if we don't know, we'll find out for sure. We'll find out. We can't so. say we know everything and don't claim to, but I'm sure we can find out for you. So that pretty much wraps us up. Uh, 